Hello, welcome to the Compressor Selection Specification and Design Lecture. We have concluded in a previous series of lectures uh, lessons on pumps which cover a part of process equipment design which deals with uh, transportation of liquids. In this uh, lecture, we are going to review types of compressors that are used in the industry and also perform some specifications calculations for compressor design. The material used in this podcast uh, lecture is adapted from our two recommended textbooks from the Coulson and Richardson Chemical Engineering series. By the end of this lecture, you should, given a process, be able to select, size, and specify not only a compressor suitable for the process, but also be able to decide on the operational configuration. That is, in addition to specifying the compressor type, you should be able to state whether a compressor is multi-stage, how many stages to be used, and also the interstage conditions such as uh, interstage temperature and pressure. Simply speaking, compressors can be seen as pumps for gases. However, with this broad application classification, one will need to include uh, blowers and fans in this classification. Compressors are used to increase the pressure of gases which we know are compressible fluids. There are a number of reasons why one would need to increase the pressure of a particular gas stream. The reasons would include uh, transportation of gases, increasing partial pressure of uh, gases to improve kinetics, solubility, etc. You can think of uh, other uses that you have encountered in your particular work environment and other classes within the, the course of chemical engineering. There are two main types of compressors, which are the positive displacement uh, compressor and the dynamic compressor. Positive displacement compressors can be further subdivided into two, namely the rotary and reciprocating compressor types. Within these categories, there are various examples and design configurations. For the dynamic compressor type, there are mainly only two design types based on the discharge flow direction of the fluid relative to the dynamic rotating part of the compressor. The third design type is just a combination of the two uh, main designs where instead of the flow of the gas going radial or axial, it's more of a mixed direction flow. This is just another picture from another source showing you types of compressors. A quick recap on these two types of compressors. The positive displacement compressors operate by trapping a specific volume of gas and forcing it into a smaller volume by this compressing the gas, while the dynamic compressors operate by accelerating the gas and converting the kinetic energy into static pressure energy. Let us take a closer look at rotary compressors. These compressors get their name from rotating motion of the transfer element that is used to compress the fluid. The main designs of this class of compressors are rotary screw compressor, sliding vane compressor, the lobe compressor, liquid ring compressor, peristaltic scroll and claw compressors. We will look at some of these designs in more detail in the next few slides. We will start with the rotary screw compressor. This is the most used compressor of this category in the industry. One common use is in the auto industry as a turbo machine in the turbocharged engines. It operates with two helical rotors that rotate towards each other, causing the teeth to mesh. As the left rotor turns clockwise, the right rotor turns counterclockwise. This forces the gases to become trapped in a central cavity. The two rotors are attached to the drive shaft and the drive shaft provides energy to operate the compressor. Here is a short uh, video animation from convergence training showing how the compressor works. Rotary screw compressors are also positive displacement machines. These compressors employ two rotating interleaved helical screws which capture air in a pocket between them. The space in which the air is trapped becomes smaller as it moves down the axis of the screw. The compressed air is discharged from the opposite end of the intake. Rotating screw compressors can be used in applications ranging from 3 horsepower to over 500 horsepower. 
They are commonly used by roadside repair crews to power air tools and are also used for automobile engine superchargers. Next in the design of rotary positive displacement compressors, we will look at the vane compressor. This design type uses a slightly off-centered rotor with sliding vanes to compress the gas as it moves within the chamber. Inlet gas flows into the vanes when they are fully extended and form the largest pockets. As the vanes turn towards the discharge port, the gas is compressed as the pocket becomes smaller. As the volume decreases, the pressure increases until maximum compression is achieved. Then the gas is discharged out of the compressor. The next design is the lobe compressor, which is characterized by two kidney bean shaped impellers used to trap and transfer the gases. The two impellers move in opposite directions on parallel mounted shafts as the lobes sweep the gases across the suction port into the discharge line. The lobes do not touch each other. A very small clearance exists between the casing and the lobes. These compressors are designed to have constant volume, discharge pressure and constant speed drives and can be used as compressors or as vacuum pumps. Next in the design of rotary positive displacement compressor is the liquid drain compressor. This design has one moving transfer element and a casing that is filled with water or seal liquid. As the rotor turns, the fluid is centrifugally forced to the outer wall of the elliptical casing and a gas pocket is formed in the center of the casing. As the liquid drain compressor rotates, a small percentage of the liquid escapes out of the discharge port. The makeup liquid seal is added to the compressor during compression. This liquid helps to cool the compressed gases. This compressor type is usually used where hazardous or toxic gases are handled. We will now move to the positive displacement reciprocating compressors. These are very common types of compressors and they work by trapping and compressing specific volumes of gases between the piston and the cylinder wall. The back and forth motion incorporated by the reciprocating compressor pulls the gas into the suction or intake and discharges into the discharge vessel. Spring loaded suction and discharge valves open and close automatically as the piston moves back and forth within the cylinder chamber. The assembly of a reciprocating compressor is shown here to indicate the building blocks. We have the piston which moves back and forth to suck the gas into the compression chamber and compress the gas. The piston is connected to the driving crankshaft by the connecting rod. The crank is rotated by the motor drive. The piston rings seal to ensure that the lubricating oils do not leak into the compression chamber. The suction and discharge lines serve as inlet and outlet. Let's take the next few minutes to go through the workings of a reciprocating compressor in an animation video. A reciprocating compressor compresses refrigerant vapor in a cylinder using a piston. In a way, Reciprocating compressors are like automobile engines. The pistons are directly driven through a wrist pin and connecting rod from a crankshaft. Depending on their size, reciprocating compressors may have one or more cylinders. Multiple cylinders may be arranged in line, opposed, or in a V. In each cylinder, reciprocating compressors have both a suction valve and a discharge valve. These valves give the compressor its ability to pump refrigerant vapor against a pressure difference. They are usually located in the head of the cylinder, in passages connected to the high or low pressure side of the system. Let's follow the compression process in a single cylinder reciprocating compressor during one complete revolution of the crankshaft. Starting with the piston at the top of its stroke, or at top dead center, the piston begins to move downward as the crankshaft rotates. Because both valves are closed, the downward moving piston reduces the pressure in the cylinder. As the pressure in the cylinder falls below the low side pressure in the suction line, the pressure difference opens the suction valve, letting refrigerant vapor flow into the cylinder. The piston continues down and pulls in more vapor until the cylinder is filled with low pressure vapor at the bottom of its stroke. 
Once past bottom dead center, the piston begins its upward stroke. The suction valve closes. As the piston moves up, it reduces the volume of the space in the cylinder, increasing the pressure of the vapor. When the pressure in the cylinder exceeds the high side pressure in the discharge line, the pressure difference pushes the discharge valve open, letting the compressed vapor flow out of the cylinder. This continues until the piston reaches the top of its stroke and most of the compressed vapor has been expelled into the discharge line. When the piston begins its downward stroke, the discharge valve closes. The complete cycle then repeats during each revolution of the crankshaft. This is the mechanical positive displacement vapor compression cycle using a reciprocating compressor. Okay, moving on. Now let us look at multi-stage compression using reciprocating compressor. If one compressor cannot achieve the required compression ratio due to some limitation, you can use a second compressor or even third and fourth to achieve the required compression. The progression used in multi-stage compression is that the compressed outlet gas from the preceding compressor feeds as an inlet to the next compressor. There may be need to there may be need to cool the gas stream before it is fed to the next compression stage. Let us spend the next minute or two watching a video animation of a four-stage reciprocating compressor. Working of a V-type multi-stage reciprocating air compressor. A simplified model of a multi-stage V-type cylinder arrangement of a reciprocating compressor is depicted. There are four cylinders namely, the first, second, third, and fourth stage cylinders. A flexible coupling transmits drive to the compressor. The coupling is fixed on the crankshaft, and also serves as a flywheel. A fan, driven by V-belt transmission, is mounted on the rear end of the crankshaft, and provides external cooling to the cylinders and coolers. In this design the first and second stage cylinders are of the trunk piston design, while the third and fourth stages are of the crosshead piston design. Compressor, walk around, showing the various components. The first and third stage cylinder cross sections are shown. Component nomenclature. First and third stage compressor working. Air from atmosphere is sucked into the first stage cylinder. Compressed air is discharged from the first stage cylinder and routed through an intercooler to the suction of the second stage cylinder. Compressed air discharged from second stage cylinder enters the third stage cylinder through an intercooler. Air is further compressed and discharged from the third stage cylinder and routed through an intercooler to the fourth stage cylinder. The final compression takes place in the fourth stage from where discharged air is routed to an aftercooler. The description is a simplified extract from the air compressor tutorial developed by Yesian Graphitec. The actual tutorial provides much more detailed explanations with a large amount of interactivity. The tutorial provides a detailed understanding on different dynamic and positive displacement compressors. Extensive graphics and animations, along with step-by-step -step meticulous explanations with interactivity, provides a very deep understanding and retention.
Okay, this concludes a detailed look at the positive displacement compressors. We will now take a look at dynamic compressors. As stated earlier, these compressors operate by accelerating the gas and converting the kinetic energy into static pressure. The two commonly used types are the axial and radial centrifugal compressors. Classification of dynamic compressors is based on flow direction of gas that is being compressed. That is, whether the flow is axial or radial centrifugal. For axial compressor, the gas leaves the rotor in an axial direction. For radial compressor, the gas leaves the centrifugal impeller in a radial direction. The fast moving blades add kinetic energy to the gas. At the inlet, suction of the gas occurs due to the reduction in static pressure due to the acceleration of the gas by the fan blades. Here with some, some diagrammatic representation showing these two types of compressors. It is important to note the application regime for each of these compressors. For higher flow rates and lower pressure ratios, the axial compressor is preferred. For lower rates and higher compression ratios, the radial compressor makes a better choice. Let us now take a look at how the axial compressor works. This compressor comprises a rotor that has low that has a row of fan-like blades. Rotating blades attached to a shaft pushes the gas over stationary blades called stators. These stator blades are attached to the casing. As the gas flow moves along the shaft in an axial direction, the gas velocity is increased by the rotating blades. The stator blades slow it down. As the gas slows down, kinetic energy is converted into pressure. In a multi-stage operation, gas velocity increases as it moves from stage to stage until it reaches the discharge. Multi-stage axial compressors can generate very high flow rates and very high discharge pressures. Axial compressors are usually limited to 16 stages due to temperature or material limitations. In the industry, axial compressors are used where high flows and moderate pressures are needed. Weight for weight, axial compressors are lighter and more efficient also much smaller than their radial centrifugal counter counterparts. Let us now spend the next few minutes watching a 3D animation MAN Diesel & Turbo is the world's leading supplier of industrial axial flow compressors. Various types of axial flow compressors are available to meet the specific requirements of different industrial sectors. Depending on the frame size, a single axial flow compressor may have a suction capacity of up to 1.5 million cubic meters per hour and be able to compress this flow to a maximum pressure of 25 bar. For example, all the air inside the Cologne Cathedral, which at 516 feet is the third tallest church building in the world, could be exhausted in around 16 minutes. The basic design of an axial flow compressor is similar to that of a fan. Blades are mounted around a shaft. In order to increase the effect, several of these blade rows are arranged axially, one behind the other. This axial stage group is often combined in a machine with one or more downstream radial stages in order to further increase the discharge pressure. A compressor of this type, such as the AR Max 1 shown here, is known as an axial radial compressor. The axial and the radial part are mounted on a common shaft, and the gas, normally air, flows through them in turn. An intercooler can be installed in between, which increases the efficiency of the compression process. Let's now take a look at the axial stage group. As they rotate, the blades strike the gas, guiding it backwards and also compressing it. This process generates a flow along the axis. That's why the machine is called axial flow compressor. 
The outlet casing guides the compressed gas to the outlet nozzle. Compression raises the temperature of a gas, which in turn somewhat reduces the density and increases the volume. As the downstream compression process would require more energy, the intercooler reduces the temperature of the gas before it enters the radial part. Axial flow compressors are able to compress extremely high volume flows, but the maximum feasible pressure ratio is limited. On the contrary, centrifugal compressors can only process lower volumes, but deliver higher pressures. Since the gas in the AR Max 1 has already lost sufficient volume through compression in the axial part, the downstream radial part is perfectly suited for bringing the gas to a high discharge pressure. MAN Diesel and Turbo has been designing and manufacturing axial flow compressors since 1950, either in air separation, nitric acid production, as blast furnace blowers, or in refinery applications, these machines have been verified hundreds of times and proven over decades. Coal liquefaction is a future-oriented application that extracts synthetic fuels and other chemicals from coal. The process requires large amounts of oxygen. Large air separation units are therefore becoming increasingly important. To extend its leading position in this area, MAN has developed AirMox. This compressor train consists of an AR Mox 1 axial flow compressor as a main air compressor, an integrally geared centrifugal compressor, and a driving steam turbine in the middle. In its blading, AR Mox 1 combines for the first time the benefits of conventional industrial compressors with those of aero engine compressors. This makes it extremely robust, as well as uniquely compact and efficient. The second type of dynamic compressor is the radial centrifugal compressor. In this compressor, the gas flow enters the impeller in an axial direction and exits in a radial direction. The gas fluid is forced through the impeller by rapidly rotating impeller blades. The kinetic energy from the rotating impeller is converted to pressure energy partially in the impeller and partially in the stationary diffusers. The diffuser consists of veinless space, a vein that is tangential to the impeller or a combination of both. The vein passage diverges to convert the velocity head into pressure energy. Centrifugal compressors accelerate the velocity of gases that is increasing the kinetic energy, which is then converted into static pressure as the gas flow leaves the volute and enters the discharge pipe. Types of centrifugal compressors are the single stage compressor which compresses the gas once. This type of compressor is used for high gas flow rates and low discharge pressures. We also have multi-stage compressors which takes the discharge of the preceding stage and pass it into the suction of the next stage. This arrangement of compressors is used for high gas flow rates and high discharge pressures. Let us spend a few minutes looking at the video animation of radial centrifugal compressors. Let's examine the centrifugal compressor, which uses non-positive displacement vapor compression for compressing large amounts of refrigerant and are typically used in very large capacity cooling systems. A centrifugal compressor has three basic components, an impeller, a diffuser, and a volute casing. Large capacity centrifugal compressors may have two or more impellers or stages in the same casing. Centrifugal compressors are usually driven by hermetic electric motors. However, open-drive centrifugal compressors are also available for applications using steam turbine, gas turbine, or engine drives. The impeller is a rotating circular disc with curved blades that is driven at high speed by the electric motor. As the impeller rotates, it moves refrigerant vapor from the suction opening in its center to the outer edge using centrifugal force. The vapor enters the suction at a relatively low velocity and leaves the outer edge of the impeller at a high velocity. This means that the impeller transfers its rotational energy to the vapor, but high velocity does not relate to high static pressure. 
To achieve the desired pressure increase, or compression, the vapor must be slowed down, converting its velocity pressure to static pressure. That's where the diffuser comes in. As high velocity vapor moves radially outward through the diffuser, the flow area increases, slowing the vapor and increasing the static pressure. Some centrifugal models have diffusers with vanes or pipes which change flow direction and further slow the vapor. The volute-shaped casing collects the slow-moving, high-pressure vapor from around the diffuser and conveys it to the discharge connection of the compressor. Inlet guide vanes control a centrifugal compressor's capacity. These movable vanes are located in the suction opening. With vanes turned fully open, the compressor produces its full cooling capacity. As the vanes are closed, they reduce refrigerant flow through the compressor, reducing the capacity of the refrigeration cycle. In addition, capacity control in a centrifugal compressor can also be obtained by changing the rotating speed. This concludes our segment on the mechanical non-positive displacement vapor compression cycle using a centrifugal compressor. We have covered the basic operating principles of most compressor types. This table shows the operating ranges of most compressor types in terms of maximum speed, maximum flow capacity in cubic meters per hour, and maximum pressure differential. As you can see, this covers several types of positive displacement compressors and dynamic compressors. These operating envelopes can also be represented in graphs such as this one. As you can see, reciprocating compressor operate in this region. Radial centrifugal compressor operates in this envelope of moderate to high flow and high compression ratios while axial compressors operate here in the high flow zone and low discharge pressure. We have concluded the introduction section and we will now introduce the calculation part of this session. In this session, you will be able to calculate things such as the work required to compress a given gas stream to required conditions. You will also be able to calculate the outlet temperature of a given stream when compressed to a given outlet pressure. From thermodynamics, we know that the pressure work term required to compress a given gas stream from condition 1 to condition 2 can be calculated by solving this numerical equation. This equation is an integral of pressure with respect to volume. Therefore, it requires a relationship between pressure and volume to describe the system during compression. How do we express pressure in terms of volume for gases? Can we use law of gases? Indeed, we can use law of gases such as equations of state. One such law being the ideal gas law. We can use the ideal gas law to express pressure P in terms of volume V to enable the integral to be presented in a format that we can integrate. We can use the, the relation PV equals to NRT. Can we now integrate this expression? Is it explicit enough to integrate? Think about it for a while. What is changing when we are compressing from state 1 to state 2? What are the variables and what, are, what remains constant? Does pressure change? Yes, obviously, it does change as it is our aim when we are compressing to change the pressure. Does the volume change? Yes, we are dealing with a compressible fluid and it is, our, it is our integral variable. Otherwise, the integral will not be valid because we are integrating with respect to volume. We know R is a constant and N will remain the same if we are keeping the mass and molar flow rate uh, constant across the compressor. What about temperature? Will it change? Yes, it will change. And then therefore, what this seems is that the integral is not explicitly stated. So this integral can only be solved if we keep temperature constant. Otherwise, we will need to express temperature in terms of volume to be able to explicitly evaluate the integral. If compression occurs at isothermal conditions, meaning at constant temperature, then for a given mass of ideal gas, PV is equal to a constant holds. The integral can now be solved explicitly to obtain isothermal compression work, which is the work done at constant temperature. 
Before we carry on further, let us refresh some terminology from our thermodynamic course. In thermodynamics, an isentropic process is a fictional idealized thermodynamic process that is adiabatic and in which the work transfer of the systems are frictionless. There is no transfer of heat or of matter and the process is supposedly reversible. As a result, the entropy of the system remains constant throughout, hence isentropic, meaning entropy does not change. We usually use the polytropic process equation for reversible or irreversible process of ideal or near ideal gases involving heat transfer or work interactions when the energy transfer ratio can be considered constant. Let us now see how we can use Mollier diagrams to determine the work required for compression. Remember, Mollier diagrams are charts of enthalpy pressure temperature entropy or enthalpy entropy HS diagrams. The work required for isentropic compression can be calculated as the difference in enthalpy. To illustrate the use of Mollier diagrams, let us look at this example. We are required to compress steam from 1 bar and 473 Kelvin to a pressure of 10 bar. We are given the isotropic efficiency of 0.85 and we are asked to calculate the power requirements to compress this stream of flow rate of 10 ton per hour. We are also expected to estimate the temperature of the exit gears. The first thing we will need is the Mollier diagram for our fluid which is steam in this case and here it is presented. On the Mollier diagram, we can now plot our initial conditions at the pressure of 1 bar and the temperature of 473 Kelvin. As you can see now, following the temperature isothermal line and then also following the pressure isobaric line where the two meet, we can plot our inlet point on the map. Then we can read off the enthalpy at a given initial inlet condition. Here we see that the enthalpy is 2,900 is kilojoule per kilogram and the entropy is 8 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. Next we can map the final outlet pressure which is uh, given as 10 bar and then we have drawn that isobaric line of 10 bar. Then we can draw the asentropic compression line from our feed point towards our 10 bar isobaric line. Remember, isentropic means increased pressure at constant entropy. Hence, we have the green line moving perpendicular along the constant entropy line. We can read the outlet enthalpy from the chart, which is approximately 3550 kilojoule per kilogram. The outlet temperature can also be read 493 Kelvin. We can conclude the calculations uh, by calculating the enthalpy required to do the isentropic compression, which is the difference between the outlet and the inlet conditions, found here to be 600 kilojoule per Kelvin. The actual work can also be calculated using the given isentropic efficiency. Furthermore, we can use the actual work to calculate the power required to do the compression using the given flow rate of steam. Let us now look at compressor maps, which are similar to pump curves uh, that we did during our pump sizing lecture. A compressor map is a chart created for a compressor to show its performance on throughput versus a compression ratio axis. In most cases, the efficiency of the compressor is usually also plotted on the compressor map. The x-axis of the compressor map is usually the entry mass flow, usually corrected flow or non-dimensional flow as opposed to the real flow. Corrected flow is the mass flow that would pass through a compressor if the inlet pressure and the temperature corresponded to MBA condition at sea level on a standard day. Basically, this is at standard conditions. Here is an example of a compressor map. On the left-hand side of the map, 
you have a surge line beyond which the compressor is too big for a given flow. And on the right hand side, we have a choke line beyond which the compressor is too small for a given flow. This means that the operation area of a compressor is between the surge line and the choke line.